Medieval Greenland was a strange and fascinating place. The island was home to two radically different communities for centuries, living at the edge of an ice sheet 12,000 feet tall. And the story behind these two communities is not as simple as the one we're often told. By the year 986 AD, Icelandic Norse communities had settled Greenland. According to the Icelandic sagas, 25 ships sailed from Iceland to Greenland immediately after its discovery by Eric the Red. Of those 25 ships, only 14 safely arrived. And this is probably a good opportunity to emphasize just how brutal the North Atlantic is. On average, the highest wave heights on Earth are found in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. The highest wave ever recorded, in fact, comes from the North Atlantic near Iceland. Rogue waves do pop up elsewhere, especially where the Agulhas Current meets the West Wind Drift near South Africa. But the North Atlantic has a near constant barrage of tall waves. For the most part, this is due to a persistent low pressure system called the Icelandic Low, which results from the temperature contrast between the relatively warm ocean and colder air. With all this in mind, it's pretty extraordinary that Iceland and Greenland were settled by ships from the east. And if the Norse had settled Iceland first, you might expect that the logical next step would be Greenland's southeast coast. It's much closer to Iceland, and it's closer to the warming influence of the North Atlantic drift. But in fact, this region was never settled, and it's virtually uninhabited today most of Greenland's modern population lives on the west coast. In fact, most Arctic animals don't even want southeast Greenland. There are muskox and Greenland wolves in northeast Greenland, but not the southeast. Caribou are abundant on the west coast, but are absent here. It's the one part of Greenland that not even the Arctic hare wants. Why is this? Well, Southeast Greenland gets absolutely buried in snow. All this snow is the result of the Icelandic low I mentioned earlier. Because Greenland is usually north of the Icelandic low, winds come at the island from a southeasterly direction, carrying buckets of water evaporated from the North Atlantic. The high slopes of the ice sheet lift the air mass, resulting in even more snow. And when the Icelandic low moves east enough to stop burying this coast in snow, something even worse happens, Pitarak winds. Normally, air becomes less dense at higher elevations. But if air sits for a while on top of the Greenland ice sheet, it can cool enough to become denser than air on the surface of the North Atlantic. As a result, it will spill down slope, reaching hurricane speeds. These are called catabatic winds in scientific terms, and they're a common feature of Greenland and Antarctica and in Greenland, they're far more common on the southeast coast. These winds will capsize ships and will blow snow from high elevations, burying anyone on the shore. The local name for these winds, Pitarax, translates to that which attacks you. In short, southeast Greenland is uninhabited for a reason. On the west coast, things are much better. After the winds that drop snow in southeast Greenland cross the ice sheet, they descend much warmer on the opposite side, thanks to the Foen effect. These Foen winds can raise winter temperatures 20 degrees Fahrenheit or about 11 degrees Celsius above the mean, and snowfall totals are much lower on this drier side of the island. As a result, Norse settlements concentrated on the west coast, just as modern settlement does today. Why do I emphasize this settlement pattern? One word, isolation. Of course, it's a longer route from the west coast to Iceland, but more importantly, to reach the habitable part of Greenland means you must sail into the stormiest part of the North Atlantic, the red zone on this map of average wave height. The Norse Greenlanders' connection to Iceland, and ultimately to Europe, relied on safe passage through the worst seas of the north. Nevertheless, they did it and their communities persisted for almost 500 years. Now, some people will be quick to tell you that this was much easier to do back then. They'll say Greenland was greener at the time. This was the medieval warm period, after all. But more recent evidence suggests otherwise. Greenland doesn't seem to have benefited much from the medieval warm period compared to Europe. 
Glaciers were as extensive in western Greenland during this period as they were during the Little Ice Age that followed, and indicators of sea surface temperature suggest that the northwest Atlantic didn't warm to the extent that the northeast did. The Greenland that Eric the Red landed on wasn't very green at all. In reality, the Norse adapted to a world much harsher than the one they left. While they did bring livestock like cattle and goats, they shifted their priority to hunting seals and caribou. To help with hunting these herds, they imported large deer hounds. And for the Greenland Norse, one resource that you might overlook was of critical importance, driftwood. Thanks to north flowing rivers from Siberia and North America, the Arctic gets filled with driftwood, which weaves around Greenland in currents. This driftwood was essential for repairing ships, construction, and for fuel. Aside from day-to-day -day survival, they built a trade network with Europe, exporting exotic goods like walrus ivory, furs, and, on a few occasions, live polar bears. The walrus ivory trade in particular was important. Most of the walrus ivory in medieval Europe the chess pieces and adornments of royalty came from Western Greenland. This was not a sporadic, short-lived outpost of naive Scandinavians who were doomed to fail from the start. They remained for hundreds of years, long enough to develop their own language, and we can probably assume their own regional identity. The Norse arrived on a vicious island, adapted, and successfully made it their home. To their north, however, arrived another group of people, a community who had circumnavigated half the Arctic, adapting over generations to its relentless hazards. The Thule people, ancestors of the modern Inuit, arrived by dog sleds, large boats, and nimble kayaks to northern Greenland and expanded south. Their cultural adaptations to the far north were numerous. To deal with polar bears, arguably the most dangerous modern megafauna. They developed powerful bows reinforced with the horns of muskox and wrapped in the sinew of reindeer to add more tension. Without wood for their fires, they burned oil made from seal fat in soapstone lamps. Instead of listing every single way these people adapted to the Arctic, I'll highlight their two greatest advantages over the Norse communities. First, their clothing was far better for an Arctic environment. While the Norse stuck with wool, the Thule people used various furs and skins. While wool may be a fine fabric for the damp and cold, it probably has an upper limit of effectiveness that's surpassed by fur. This was emphasized by Antarctic explorer Roald Amundsen in the early 1900s before the invention of synthetic fabrics. Caribou fur may be the best, due to the tiny air pockets in each hair adding insulation. Thule women made these clothes waterproof with a unique method of sewing. They made two parallel lines of very tiny, close stitches and used sinew as thread. When the sinew got wet, it would swell and close the seam, closing too tight for any water to soak through. Better clothing allowed the Thule to be more active and productive during the worst weather conditions. But a more important difference between the Norse and the Thule may have been hunting techniques. The Norse ultimately came from a region where the sea doesn't freeze over in winter, which is unique for latitudes this high. When sea ice closed Greenland's shores in winter, the Norse lost their ability to hunt seals and fish. So by late winter and early spring, rations were always critically low. This was an issue the Thule people learned to work around. Before the ice closed the sea completely, they used nimble kayaks to weave between pack ice and chase down seals. But after the ice closed the sea, tactics had to change altogether. With the help of his dog's keen sense of smell, the hunter would first find a seal's breathing hole, concealed by snow and slush. Next, he would place a hare on the edge of the hole. After he waited for hours, the hare would move slightly, signaling the exhale of a stealthy seal beneath the snow-covered water. In the long nights of winter, he may need to rely more on sound, waiting hours to hear the slightest breathing. He then used a weapon completely alien to the Norse, a toggling harpoon. The tip of the toggling harpoon detaches and twists horizontally inside the seal, keeping it held in place. This was critical to ice hunting because after spearing the seal, the hunter had a lot more work to do. He would need to chip a larger hole through the thick ice in order to pull the animal out. It was a complicated process and likely had to be passed down from elder hunters to the youth over many years. 
but by doing so, the Thule people had a secure food source through the worst part of the year. From the 1300s onward, the Thule expanded in Greenland regardless of any climatic swings and came directly in contact with the Norse. What did these two radically different societies, from opposite ends of the world, think of each other? Did they become bitter enemies? Friends? Trading partners? Artifacts and historical accounts can give us some idea, but our imagination will have to do the rest. This little wooden doll was found in a medieval Thule settlement on Baffin Island, just to the west. The figure wears distinctly European clothing, a long, split tunic with edge trim, the sort of detail you don't just remember from a distant chance encounter. In general, there are many more Norse artifacts at Thule sites than vice versa, which could indicate a violent history of raiding. On the other hand, it might indicate the Norse traded less perishable items for things like meat, something the Thule were very good at getting. If that's the case, these fragments of male armor from a Thule site on Ellesmere Island must tell an interesting story. Male armor at the time was an extremely expensive, lifelong possession. If the owner traded it, they must have wanted something else very badly. From both the Thule and the Norse, we have accounts of trade, but also raiding and small-scale conflicts. For instance, there was a particularly devastating raid in 1379. According to the Norse, the Skraelings, their word for the Thule, killed 18 men and took two boys and a woman as captives. No doubt, the relationship between these two societies was a rocky one. But evidence for large-scale conflict is scarce. Archaeologists tend to look for evidence of burned buildings to suggest raiding, and there's little evidence of such fires. This rule might not apply very well to medieval Greenland, however, where people treated every scrap of wood as a valuable commodity. Evidence of warfare and raiding is scarce, but one thing is clear. The Norse population slowly declined through the 1300s and 1400s, while the Thule became more numerous. The Little Ice Age probably did play part of the role in this decline, but climate may not have been the dominant factor, as was once assumed. Most scholars agree that some combination of factors likely led to the demise of the Norse in Greenland. For one, the Black Death in Europe and Iceland created acres of fallow fields and major labor shortages, all of which increased opportunity for the lowly peasant. The young and ambitious members of the Greenland settlements may have just returned to their ancestral homelands following the promise of a better life. Meanwhile, the valuable walrus ivory that Greenland exported became less valuable. Trade between Europe, the Far East, and Africa increased, allowing more elephant ivory to reach the halls of European royalty. And by the late 1400s, the Portuguese had established ports in West Africa, ensuring that elephant ivory would reach European shores at a fraction of its former price. If the value of walrus ivory declined, this may have been the final push for Greenlanders to find a livelihood elsewhere. In addition, North Atlantic storms seem to have become more vicious around this time, which weakened the connection between Greenland and Europe, reducing trade and reducing new migrants. In the 1540s, Icelandic sailors were blown off course and landed in Greenland. But by this time, the only thing moving through the old houses and churches was an icy wind. They did find one Norse man, lying face down on the cobble beach of a fjord. In his hand was a knife worn down to the spine. Likely the last Norse Greenlander, his body served as a testament to the struggle against this island's relentless troubles. Thanks for watching.